Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Before we get started, I just want to remind listeners to please go to econtalk.org. And in the upper left-hand corner, corner, you'll find a link to our annual listener survey where you can vote for your favorite episodes of 2015. Please do it today. The survey will close on January 31st. And please excuse my voice today. You can tell I have a cold. Today is January 5th, 2016, and my guest is Josh Luber. He runs the website campless.com. And as far as I can tell, he's the leading authority on the market for athletic shoes, or as they are sometimes called, sneakers. I say he's the leading authority, but as far as I can tell, no one else is close. Maybe no one else, period. Josh, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you. Welcome. Now, I've got a feeling many of our listeners don't know much about the sneaker market. Uh, most of us think they're people who buy sneakers when they need them. My sons play basketball. So I went out and bought him sneakers for that. We went to a shoe store at the mall. We spent something between 60 and and $100. But there's another world out there. Tell us about it. Yeah, and I, I think the other world, um, I need to, to preface. It was a very nice uh, intro you gave. Um, but I am, uh, I'd say, an expert not on the sneaker market in general, but on the secondary market for sneakers or the resale market. So this is people buying and selling sneakers uh, on eBay, on other websites, um, in person, at sneaker stores, um, after they've been purchased at retail. So a pair of Air Jordans sells for $200 at Foot Locker, and someone buys them for Foot Locker and turns around and puts them on eBay and sells them for $400 or $500 or $1,000. And um, and that market, the, the secondary market for sneakers, has existed you know forever, for as long as Air Jordans have released, since you know 1985. But it's really been in the past five years, really, since you know the beginning of 2011, uh, 2012, that the resale market really blew up. And uh, in the past five years, the number of new people coming to the market, the number of new releases, and the overall size of that market has just grown like crazy. Uh, and it's provided me with an opportunity to start doing this as a career, as opposed to just um, uh, you know as a uh, as a personal hobby. Uh, I am 37 years old. I have collected sneakers all my life. I still have sneakers from when I was, you know, 10, 12 years old that I, uh, that I still have them. And, uh, and I've never worked in the sneaker industry uh, at all um, up until uh, a few years ago when I started campus on the side uh, while working at IBM and, uh, and did that on the side for a couple of years. And it was only about six months ago now that I'd be able to, to do this as a, as a full-time career. So how many pairs of sneakers do you have? That's a tough question. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. The last time I counted, it was about 250. My guess is it's uh, close to 300. Uh, but I just moved. And uh, I moved from Philadelphia to Detroit. And as part of that move, I'm building myself a, a new shoe room wall. And uh, I'm actually sitting in the middle of the construction of it right now. And so in about a week or so, when it's done... I will get to count them again and uh, and fill up the wall and have a better idea. But my guess is three hundred. Is that a big number? It's seen, you know for me. After I, I should have counted mine before I did this interview. I probably have four, three pairs, maybe. Um, I've got a yeah, maybe three pairs. Uh, so through through two hundred fifty, three hundred seems like a a big number. Is it a big number? Uh, you know, um, relative to, uh, people who aren't in this, uh, you know, game. Um, yeah, but, um, no, it's, it's absolutely not. Um, there are people that have thousands of sneakers. So, you know, it's a, it's a relatively modest collection within the, the sneaker world. Um, it's certainly, uh, more than a lot and it certainly surprises a lot of people. Um, but no, I mean, there's people that have thousands. So I saw your Ted talk and we'll put a link up to it. Um, uh, one of the things that startled about this phenomenon, one of the things that startled me uh, is what happens on Saturday mornings that I was totally unaware of. Uh, so talk about uh, what goes on in this 
collectible market uh, in the resale market on Saturday morning, um, which is amazing. Yeah. Uh, well, so you, you know, you mentioned the the name of my company, Campless, and and that name uh, is derived from you know what is historically and even today um, the best and sometimes only way to get limited release sneakers, which is camping outside of sneaker stores. Um, and so the name Campless is derived from, and our motto is no more camp less as we are a, a data company. And so, you know, to get to that is every single, uh, weekend, uh, every single Saturday, there are sneaker releases. Uh, most weekends there are, you know, multiple three, four, five, six, seven, you know, big releases that some sneaker heads somewhere care about. And, um, and a lot of them are just first come first serve at, uh, at sneaker stores. And so what do you do? Um, you know, kids will start camping out there the day before, you know, the week before, depending on how big that release is. And so, you know, you drive by any Foot Locker, any sneaker boutique at, you know, 8 a.m. on a Saturday morning, and there'll be a line of kids, you know, sitting outside waiting to get in and waiting to buy the shoes. And, you know, depending on how big the release is, is how long they've been sitting outside uh, waiting to, to get sneakers. And so... Um, that is, you know, changed a little bit, um, over the past couple of years as, you know, people, uh, more and more releases happen online. Um, but that's still kind of bread and butter of, of how the, the sneaker industry works. So this is extraordinary. Again, if you don't know anything about it and I didn't, uh, what do you mean there's these re-releases go into more detail about what's actually happening and how do people know what's coming? Is it announced somewhere? Do they, and what do you mean by big? Why are some bigger than others? Yeah. So uh, in 2003, there was a book published called Where Do You Get Those? And uh, it, was a, it was a look at sneaker culture through, uh, I guess, the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And that was the kind of seminal sneaker question. You know, you'd walk down the street, you'd see someone wearing some sneakers, like, how oh, where'd you get those? Uh, because back then, um, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have the sort of free flow of information to know uh, where every sneaker is being released and when. And now we do. And so there are, you know, uh, there's probably over 60, 70 different um, sneaker blogs that track, you know, when sneakers are being released and pictures of them and um, uh, and what celebrity is wearing them and, and where to buy them. And so um, everyone knows where what sneakers are going to be released where. And those could be, you know, Air Jordans, they could be Nikes, they can be, you know, other brands. And, um, and each of the, every single sneaker release, and what I mean by that is a specific shoe, a specific model, a specific colorway. So the Air Jordan uh, line, there's been 29 different Air Jordan models. Uh, so maybe it's, you know, the Air Jordan, uh, the Air Jordan 8 in a, uh, blue and, and black color, right? Called the Air Jordan 8 Aqua came out, you know, a couple months ago. And so that particular release, that particular shoe um, has a certain demand. There are certain people that want that. And, uh, and to try to get that sneaker, people will camp out. They will, you know, try to buy it online. And that sneaker or any of the sneakers that we're talking about, um, as a general rule, right, there are more people that want it then there is supply. And because of that, the shoe will sell out instantly at retail. Uh, it will be very hard to, to get a pair because there will be many people waiting, you know, to get a pair. So they'll sell out instantly or at least pretty quickly, uh, both online and at stores. And those shoes will immediately be listed on eBay and other, uh, sneaker resale sites, uh, for people to, you know, to resell them and, and make money. And, you know, over the past year or so, the market as a whole has slowed down a little bit. And, you know, not every single shoe, not every single Air Jordan, which is really kind of the, the core of the sneaker market, not every single Air Jordan can people make a ton of money on. But, you know, there's there's still just so many sneakers where, um, you know, a sneaker might cost $200 at retail and might sell for $1,000 on the secondary market just because of that difference between supply and demand. And every single release, every single sneaker is a kind of another shot at that um, game, at that you know difference between supply and demand and how the brands play that, how Nike and Adidas and the other brands choose, you know, how many to release and where and you know and what those shoes are, you know, become worth on the secondary market based on who wants them and how many people want them. You said the market slowed down a little bit in the last year. Of course, so has the 
S and P five hundred. Um, so it's not that different from other assets. And one of the things we're going to be talking about later is that uh, sneakers as an investment, and some of the things you've, some of the thoughts you've had about that, and where your data come from are utterly fascinating. But I, I just want to make an observation now that's crucial, uh, and I think a lot of people uh, get confused. Uh, in, in an open market, uh, supply and demand's uh, very powerful. So the resale market's a pretty open market, as you point out in your talk uh, at TED. And as a result, the price reflects the relative demand, the demand certainly. And the supply, though, is kind of, it's not a, it's not a, a free market supply. It, it's decided by Nike. They make a decision, and they're the dominant player in this market, as you point out. Uh, they make a decision about two things. They have to decide what retail price to set and how many shoes to produce. That in turn is going to affect, certainly the number is going to affect the resale price in the open market on eBay. But they've made a conscious decision to limit the quantity such that there is a big premium on the resale market. They don't have to do that. They could either meet the demand at the $200 retail price or they could decide to create a lot more shoes, still sell them at $200, but reduce the resale value of those as well. And they've chosen not to do that, correct? Yeah, it, it, that is a, a good uh, intro to a very nuanced and complicated, um, you know, business construct that Nike has created, uh, and how many pairs they release and how much they charge for them, uh, while trying to maintain, you know, the secondary market. Um, at a at a most basic level, the secondary market becomes a um, a marketing uh, a platform, you know, for Nike, right? Um, they can ensure sellouts. They can ensure, you know, a level of demand and hype and marketing and, and prestige that goes along with their product by having a mismatch, uh, you know, a, a mismatch between you know, supply and demand. And a, a simple sort of example of, of why uh, limited supply is, is more valuable in this, uh, in this market, right? So let's say demand is 100 and they produce 96. Well, you're going to definitely sell out all 96, right? There's going to be, you know, more people that want it than you can produce. So there'll be retail sellouts. The secondary market will exist. Uh, and, you know, shoes will be worth more than the $200 retail price. But let's say they produce 102, right? Demand's 100 and they produce 102. They might only sell 90 or 80 or some number below 96, right? And they produced more. Right? And the reason why is because once that demand supply uh, match crosses, right, and now there's more supply than there is demand, well, sneakerheads don't necessarily want those shoes anymore. They're not worth more than the $200 they're going to pay for it. They're not rare. Anybody can walk in the store and get a pair. So it, it doesn't even, uh, you know, it doesn't even go back to the entire sort of sneakerhead um, uh, you know, desire to have sneakers that no one else has. The whole where do you get those? Um, you know that 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 is still very true today. That the underlying uh, you know reasons for that, even though people know where to get it, but the idea of wanting to wear sneakers that no one else has, or to make people say, "Hey, you know, where'd you get those?" That you know, I want those because I can't just walk into a store and get them and find them. And so, you know, it's a really fine line between that supply and demand. Uh, line because obviously the brands are in the business of selling sneakers. So they want to produce as many pairs as they possibly can and sell as many pairs as they possibly can without crossing that line. And obviously demand is not a known yeah, quantity. It's, it's not like, right? I mean, they have to predict it. And it's also not only do they have to predict it, but it's not, um, it's not a constant variable. Yeah. I mean, it, it is it, it is absolutely tied to supply, right? Scarcity drives demand. But there's a piece. So you know, the, but there's a piece. Of this sorry, go ahead. there's a piece of this that's um, here, that we need to quantify, and you've quantified it, which is phenomenal. Um, when you create an artificial, a lot of brands would like to try this. They can't. Uh, there's something special about Nike. There's a certain cultural phenomenon that's happened that you know, if other people try to say, well, we'll just make our stuff scarce and we'll make a lot more. Uh, per sneaker, they can't, or a lot more per whatever it is, they can't always do that. Most of them can't ever do it. But if, if Nike has a little bit of monopoly power because of this cachet that we're talking about, 
they're also giving away a lot of money. When you see people waiting in line, it means you could have charged more. Now, there is uncertainty, as you point out. And if you make a mistake, you can lose your cachet. Uh, something becomes readily available uh, and easy. You didn't have to get the heroic nature of camping out and all that. But the amount of money that's being uh, made by on the resale market is substantial. So talk about that for a minute as a measure of how much Nike is willing to sacrifice in order to create this overarching idea that their sneakers are special or scarce or rare. Well, you know, I, I disagree with the premise a little bit that Nike is sacrificing that money. Um, right. And But let me come back to first the amount of it. So um, the average profit on the secondary market uh, is about a third. Right. So markups about, you know, about 33 percent um, on retail price. And um, in uh, in 2014, and we're kind of just doing the 2015 numbers now, but in, in 2014, uh, the secondary market was about 1.2 billion uh, in the U.S. Right, so you know a third of that, you know, is about 400 million dollars profit that's being made um, by resellers as a whole. Right, and that's you know it it sounds like a lot of money, um, you know, but the global or you know the the U.S. sneaker market, the you know the retail sneaker market is you know in the billions, um, and I think it's like 20 billion for U.S. So you know, if there's a a four hundred dollar piece, a four hundred million dollar piece of profit that is being made by not, you know, it's not a, a handful of people that make a lot of money. No. It's a lot of people that make a little bit yep. of money. Um, you know, in 2015, there were 136 thousand people that sold at least one pair of sneakers on eBay. So it's you know, it, it's a lot of people making a couple bucks here or there. And so um, the idea that that it's not that it's money it's Nike sacrificing. You know they can't necessarily sell the sneakers for uh, for thirty percent more, Correct. right? They can't necessarily sell more sneakers because we get in the same uh, construct that I was just talking about, right? If they produce one hundred and two, right, they might actually sell less than if they produce ninety six. And so there is that piece of money that's out there, and Nike can take a little bit of it. And, and I I keep saying Nike because Nike and, and which owns Jordan brand. Uh, accounts for ninety six percent of the secondary market in dollars, so it's really you know all about them. They can take a little bit of, of the margins by increasing prices a little bit, uh, by increasing supply a little bit, and therefore driving down you know margins and and, uh, and demand you know a little bit. Um, but if they cross that line, right, then they're going to actually make less money than they would originally. So it's a really fine balancing act, and every single release, every single you know, shoe that comes out every single weekend is another chance to get that, you know, that balancing act right and try to figure out where they're maximizing their business, you know, in relation to the secondary market and and, and everyone else, both from a, a short term perspective in terms of maximizing sales, but also what's that mean to the long term, you know, brand equity and, and cachet of owning Nikes and owning Jordans, which is a lot of what this is about. Is there a premium paid for... Um condition of the sneaker in in other words especially mint if if the shoe is ever, never worn do you make more money or if you can at least claim that credibly yeah absolutely um I, the term for new sneakers is called dead stock um dead stock uh, you know it refers to shoes that have been unworn new in the box and uh on the secondary market about two-thirds of the market uh, is dead stock and about a third is used. And uh, dead stock is relatively easy to value because people know what that condition is. And there's definitely ways to tell if a shoe's, you know, been worn, um, even if it's, you know, been cleaned well, et cetera, there, there's ways to tell. Um, and, uh, and that obviously commands the most amount of money. And it's just like, you know, any other cars or baseball cards or anything else. Right, the the worse the condition is, the less uh, valuable it will be, and so uh, for people that buy and sell used sneakers, um, you know, a lot of it's like a car, right? Like driven once, you know, or dri just driven off the lot. So if a shoe's been worn once or twice, you can usually get a great deal on a shoe that is basically like new. Um, but people, you know, share pictures and and um, and try to figure out, you know, what a, a shoe is worth. Uh, the more it's worn, because every shoe is also different. You know, some shoes crease differently, some shoes, you know, you know show wear differently, et cetera. So, you know, it's very much a shoe by shoe basis. Do you think that Nike profits or benefits f from this phenomenon in their current release 
So the reason I, I don't know if that's clear what I mean, but I mean, this is a strange phenomenon. This is a, this is a, this re-releasing of collectibles, this idea that, that there is, has become a, ma- a market for these antique shoes, you could call them, uh, the way there is for baseball cards, for coins, for other things. And of course, baseball cards don't get reissued. They're valuable for, in general, for, for being collected and being old. These are new releases of older models that are limited in number. Does Nike expect to benefit for their non-antique releases, non-re-releases? Because usually, you know, you do this to create excitement, but it's an excitement among a small subculture of people like you, sneakerheads, and people like me don't know about it. We don't, I, I don't, I've never seen the lines. I've, you know, I don't, there's not much promotional side benefit. You, you make, in your TED Talk, you mentioned how people twice a year, every two years see Apple products are in high demand. There's a big line outside the Apple stores. This is going on every week and it's kind of quiet. Um, is Nike benefiting from that in a, other than just this, that they can keep selling old models for $200? Yeah, so, uh, so two things. First of all, um, there certainly are the re-release of, of older uh, Jordan models and other shoes, but um, it's also about the, the the new releases, you know, every week. And some of those have very high demand and some of them, um, you know, sell for a lot on the secondary market. So it, it it's not just what you call sort of a collectible or, or um, an antique, right? I mean, they are uh, new releases as well that have that same supply and demand profile. Um, that said, um, there is definitely sort of marketing value uh, in having this, uh, the sort of sneakerhead market and, and what happens there. Um, well, first of all, let's also point out that, that you know, a lot of the, these sneakerhead releases are the biggest individual uh, releases of the year for uh, Nike and Jordan brand across all the categories, across all of their um, sneakers. Now, obviously, in the aggregate, they sell a whole lot more if you add up everything else that doesn't fall within the sort of sneakerhead world. Um, but the Air Jordans, for example, you know, those are usually the biggest release every month, you know, for Nike and for Jordan brand are those retro Jordan releases. Um, the Christmas release, every Christmas, there's a pair of Air Jordan 11s, the Air Jordan Model 11, that is released. And we haven't seen the numbers from this past Christmas, but but last year is called the Air Jordan 11 Legend Blue. Sold something like 700, 750,000 pairs at retail, right? And, you know, that's in, you know, one, you know, basically one weekend. So, I mean, that those numbers are still uh, numbers. really driving the retail <laughs> business for, you know, for Nike and for Jordan brand. So that said, to your point around does it influence, you know, the rest of the market? Absolutely. Now, you may not be, you know, as familiar, you know, with it, but anytime you've seen any any media around sneakers and violence and riots and, you know, any sort of crazy stuff around, you know, it's all related to this. And a lot of the mainstream media spin has been, at least up until the past couple of years, it's always been kind of on the negative side and, and sort of violence that surrounds this sort of stuff. And look, that definitely happens You know, I'm not denying that that happens, but that's a very small part of, you know, a bigger picture and a bigger story that's going on here, which is just the kind of, you know, hysteria and sort of consumer passion um, and collector passion that happens that causes every single weekend there to be thousands of people that line up outside of stores all across the country and are doing the same thing online, you know, by the way, as well. So these stories kind of, you know, build um, or where you see, you know, you, you, if you happen to be going into a Foot Locker, right, on a Saturday morning, and you're like, well, you know, why are there 600 people waiting in line right there, you know, to get in? And all of that builds the same, uh, you know, scenario that, that I think the brand's hope happens, which is that, you know, when your average consumer goes into a store and buys whatever, maybe they buy one pair of sneakers a year, well, maybe now they're more inclined to buy Jordan brand products or Nike brand products because, you know, they have this, you know, all the hype and marketing and all the things they've seen, you know, that's happened. And in the past couple of years, it's become more and more prominent within kind of mainstream media, et cetera. Um, and so that hopefully kind of trickles down, you know, to, you know, a, a marketing and basically brand cachet that other people can still wear those products, even if they're not wearing 
you know, a pair of shoes that cost a thousand dollars. Yeah, the whole thing reminds me a little bit about De Beers and the flow of diamonds into the market, where you know they had this huge stock of diamonds out in the world, but it's kind of most people want a new one; they want their own, and uh, they don't spread it around much. There's not in this in the De Beers case, there's not as much of a resale market, but uh, there's still people give away their you know their wedding rings to um, to their children or grandchildren to use in some situations, but. Uh, there, it's just a fascinating um, phenomenon that you're describing. Let's talk about your website. It's an incredible uh, bit of data analysis. Uh, tell listeners what you did to create it and what it, what it contains. Yeah, so Campus, you know, we talk about it as a sneakerhead data company. Um, at the most basic fundamental level, Campus is a, a price guide for the secondary market. It's the Kelly Blue Book for sneakers. And um, I started Campus in uh, beginning of 2012, and the goal at the time was just, can we build a price guide? Can we, you know, use real data to figure out what sneakers are actually worth? And so um, I started by, you know, tapping into eBay's API to pull in eBay auctions, uh, knowing that eBay is the largest uh, sneaker marketplace. Uh, I mentioned the U.S. sneaker market's about 1.2 billion. eBay is about a third of that, about 350 to 400 million, and no one else has even a fraction uh, that eBay does. So it's clearly where the majority of transactions are taking place. So we start pulling in eBay data. We start trying to analyze it and figure out, you know, can we tie this back to individual shoes and figure out, you know, can create a price guide. From there, the data, um, you know, we we're able to do a lot more with it. So um, you know, we say it's a price guide, but it's, you know, there must, there's probably, you know, 10 to 15 standard statistics for every single sneaker, price and volume and volatility and, and uh, premium. So there's a lot of different, um, there's a lot of different statistics that are out there that people can use either just for their own, you know, amusement for content that people are interested in, in knowing more about it. But also if you're trying to buy or sell sneakers to understand well, how many pairs are on the market. Right. You know, how uh, how volatile is the sneaker rate? How much can I expect the price to fluctuate in addition to things like, you know, what is the market price? And that led to the blog, which is kind of the second half of the, the site. And the campus blog is like Freakonomics for sneakers, right, where we've taken, you know, and, and some are some some blog posts are as simple as just what shoe released this past weekend, how many pairs are on the market, you know, what's it selling for? Others are as complicated and nuanced as, you know, like a finance textbook. Um, there's one post in particular that is an analysis as to how Nike leverages the secondary market. And that took months to write and, um, you know, and is probably as dense as a finance textbook, right? But it's a level of analysis on this industry and this market that just didn't exist. And it's fun. And we get to kind of dive into this and see what insights we can pull out, you know, from this data. And that has evolved, right, where we're at an unbelievable transition point to have this conversation where we are about to launch a stock market for sneakers and move what is essentially a data company into a marketplace um, where, you know, a stock market is essentially just a, a data company. It's a collection of, of data to surface what is a market price and how to match buyers and sellers across a market price. And so we're doing that and we're, we're transitioning campus from a data company to a stock market. Uh, and that company is called StockX and that actually will, will launch within the next couple of weeks. So talk about the amount of data that you're looking at. It's quite a bit, right? Yeah. Um, so I think right now in our database, we have somewhere around 25 million uh, eBay auctions. And then um, I don't have exact numbers, but we collect data from basically every corner of, you know, the sneaker resale market that we can get our hands on. That includes Facebook, Instagram, um, consignment shops, uh, other resale sites. Um, you know, again, none of them have a fraction of the market that eBay does right now. So we use all that data in different ways. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a lot. And in some cases, it becomes a little bit overwhelming. What are some of the issues you had? I mean, you talk about them occasionally on the site. Um, in, in gathering that data, I think most people, and I have to confess, I think some economists, they just take whatever they've got and they just say, well, it's the best we got. But you, um, you've you been uh, very thorough. Uh, one of the issues you've dealt with is fakes. 
So talk about how you've dealt with that and what other issues arise in trying to make sure your data are accurate. Yeah, so uh, the fake issue is a, is a subset of the sort of larger issue around eBay and just cleaning the data and making it useful. Um, eBay is not a um, an inventoried uh, marketplace, right? Anyone can go there and they can create whatever listing they want and they can describe it however they want. And so uh, you get a whole lot of uh, junk, a whole lot of keywords that people put into auctions and descriptions so that their auctions pop up. And so you might get something like, you know, an Air Jordan 6 Carmine, which is the name of a particular shoe. And it'll say Air Jordan 6 Carmine. And then it'll say, you know, Yeezy, Kobe, LeBron, and, and 19 other words, you know, in the title. <laughs> so, you know, as a data, you know, you know, analysis, how do we know what shoe is actually being sold in that auction? How do we know it's a Jordan 6 Carmine and not, you know, a, a Kobe Bryant shoe or a LeBron James shoe? And so that process of cleaning the data and, and you know, identifying it is by far the most complicated and most time consuming part of all of the work that we've done. Um, but because we've done it, we've now have really clean data that we can do cool stuff with. And the secondary part of that, you know, is then, well, now we know exactly what shoes they are. Now, how do we do things like eliminate fakes? How do we do things like eliminate uh, auctions that have multiple uh, sneakers within one auction? And, you know, there's about three or four different um, tactics that we do uh, to uh, to get there. But at the most basic level, there's just standard statistical outlier analysis. So we can see, right, you know, if 95% of the shoes are all within a certain price range, right, and, you know, 5%, you know, are all way, way low, uh, you know, that's a pretty good indication that those shoes are uh, are fake or at the very least not the shoe, you know, we're trying to um, to look at. Um, you know, we also, you know, there's certain words that people put in auctions. Sometimes people are trying to sell fakes and are not uh, not trying to be secretive about it. So words like um, unauthorized or UA or replica um, that we know that people are actually trying and saying, you know, being honest about it. Hey, here's a fake shoe. I'm, I'm trying to sell it. So there's a lot of things that we do. But at the end of the day, because, you know, we're looking at 25 million auctions and always adding more, you know, if someone was selling a fake shoe, but, you know, used real pictures and said, you know, this is real and, and priced it exactly like the reals, um, we would never know. But there's a question about whether that's even a problem, right? Because what we're trying to do is is ascertain market price. And if the buyer doesn't know and genuinely believes they're buying a real sneaker, um, maybe it doesn't matter. And that's a kind of philosophical, you know, yeah, sure. data debate, right? But um, but at the end of the day, we do do everything we can to, to eliminate them. So you had a very nice analysis of um, how people's perception of a price of a particular sneaker is not, uh, can be inaccurate and in how you discovered, I think it was that, um, which, which way does it go? People think it's, the shoes are worth less than they actually are more. I forgot now. More, and that's a, that's a great, great, um, of all the work that we've done, that's kind of one of my personal favorites that, that often gets kind of overlooked or that people don't. Um, so the analysis was, right, is we, we were creating this price guide and we would get people all the time that says, they would say, oh, those prices are way too low. I can never find them on eBay, you know. And so we said, all right, well, we need to look into this more, right? Maybe we're doing something wrong. And what we found was that there's a, a big difference between people's perception of market price based on, you know, basically just uh, browsing. You know, browsing eBay, right? And so if you browse eBay or any marketplace for that matter, right, if you just browse you know, any marketplace, you know, at any given time, what you're going to see are shoes that are sitting. They are not sold because they are overpriced, right? If a shoe is a great deal. Right, if a shoe's underpriced, someone's going to buy that immediately. So it's going to sit for a lot shorter time than if a shoe's overpriced. And the more overpriced something is, the longer it sits, and the more likely it is that you're going to see that if you look at eBay at any given time. So we yeah, actually went coolest. through and figured, <laughs> yeah. So we I just went through that. and figured out how how long do sneakers sit, right? At what price, et cetera. And we figured out that there was, you know, something like a a gap of um, I don't know what it was, maybe like. I don't know, 18% or 20% or something. I forget the exact number that, um, cause I mean that this was, you know, like two and a half years ago. Um, I should know it, but th there was That's a right. big gap between P 
people's perception of what market price was and what it actually was. And that was pretty cool and uh, to, to be able to quantify that. Yeah, no, it's beautiful. It reminds me of um, on StubHub, you know, people will say Super Bowl tickets are selling for X. Well, not exactly. They're being listed for X. And, you, and most of us have no idea whether those transactions take place and at what price they ultimately take place at. And I think one of the – what you've done here, which is really – I mean, that's just a beautiful, beautiful bit of applied – empirical analysis, the idea that prices that are, to quote, too high or the, sell or, or the sellers are willing to wait and maybe they'll get the higher price, uh, those are going to be seen more often uh, by people who just periodically visit the site and browse around and look around. It's just uh, – it's really quite – it's really it's really cool. Um, and, 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 and let me, let me say that that analysis was actually a big part of – how we're building StockX, the stock market, which is to say that, you know, on the StockX marketplace, when you go there, right, you can see on the product page every single pair that has sold. So what the act and right next to all the listings. So you can see, you know, what the actual sales are so that there's you don't have this perception problem. Right. That was that was at the most fundamental level. Like, right, well, if we're going to build a, a marketplace that's built on this data, we need to be able to surface it at the exact same time to eliminate this perception problem. And one of the things you had in the old, in the, at Campless, I don't know if you still do this, and I'm sure you'll do something like it maybe in the new one, but uh, you can create your own portfolio that is your own collection of shoes that you own and then watch it um, move up and down over time. Uh, do, you still, do you still do that? Yeah, absolutely, right? Um, that concept of sneaker collections or sneaker portfolios is, uh, is one of the most fun things that, that we've built, right? To allow sneakerheads to, you know, basically manage their sneaker collection the same way that someone would manage, a, you know, an investment portfolio and have access to all the same analytics and see the value over time. And then, you know, to, to back to the sort of sneakerhead mentality, share it and compare it with other people to be able to rank your collection versus other people and, and share it. And um, and I we've never had more requests to add more sneakers to the site as quickly as we did once we put that up because then everyone wanted every sneaker, you know, Ever. that they had in their collection, <laughs> right? No matter what it is, no matter how valuable it is, you know, like well, add this sneaker because everyone wanted to basically, you know, have their full collection up there. And so we've been, we've been trying to do that, but yeah, that same concept will, will move forward, but it will then be even more like an actual, you know, portfolio on StockX because then, it's as simple to, to trade, you know, to buy and sell it as looking in your portfolio and just clicking, you know, sell you know, because it's already, you know, lined up in, in that fashion. So, you know, sneaker portfolios are, are a pretty cool thing. So in economics, there's an idea of a thin market or a thick market. It's inherently a, a, a vague and somewhat ambiguous concept. But let's say I'm, I'm like you and I have, say, 300 pairs of sneakers and I'm at, according to at current prices there's some value of, those, of that whole portfolio – which in theory, if I liquidated it, I would get something like that if I put it all of it at one at a time up on eBay, say. But some of those – I assume some of those sneakers trade rarely, uh, very infrequently, or is that not true? If it, if it is true, then, then there's more uncertainty about the value of, of any one pair that you might have in your portfolio. If they're trading regularly and you always know you can get a certain price, then the value of the portfolio is more reliable. Uh, how thick or thin is this market? Yeah, so the within the so the the majority of sneaker sales for any individual shoe that's released, you know, happens the day it released, right? And then the next day, and then the next day, and then it, it you know, it's a, a slowly sort of deteriorating <laughs> right. Um and so usually what we see is by eighteen to twenty four months, um the the market has gotten to a place where there's only a handful of transactions that occur uh, at any given you know time period, and you're really in a seller's market that you know particularly at that point if you have a, a new pair right a, a dead stock unworn pair um, that the seller can pretty much command whatever they want because there's so few pairs on the market, and particularly if that seller is willing to wait. Right. And find the right buyer. Right. They they pretty much have all the leverage because, you know, they've you know gone out. I mean, they're just you know, there's not that many pairs out there. There's a relatively high level of volatility anyway within sneakers 
just because there's a lot of different channels, there's a lot of different places. And up until Campus and now StockX, there's never really been a centralized you know, place where all that data, you know, comes together that people can actually see that, oh, well, you know, this is what, you know, the market price really is. Um, but that said, you know, we see that kind of 18 to 24 month cliff that really changes the overall dynamic in, you know, and what that, that looks like and moving from where the buyers have a lot of leverage because there's so many pairs on the market, you know, or at least the low volatility to really high volatility and the sellers having leverage when there's not a lot of pairs on the market. Can you tell us how many visitors come to your site? Uh, I, to be honest, I haven't even looked at campus numbers in a while, but, um, you know, it was relatively modest. You know, it was somewhere under 100,000. Um, but it's, uh, you know, usually what happens is, you know, a lot of people use our app. Uh, a lot of our blog po uh, posts and content get syndicated. And, um, you know, and, and it's up until, you know, a big part of building StockX is around, making a product and making something that is um, useful for all sneakerheads, not just those that are kind of really into sneakers and data and, uh, and are kind of actively buying and selling sneakers. That was also the concept behind, you know, stock portfolios and sneaker portfolios is that even if you're not buying and selling, right, you have a sneaker collection and so you can use it. So again, without getting into the specifics, because I, I understand it's not, it's not a precise number, but when you say under 100,000, 100, is under a hundred thousand, and if you'd asked, I think some listeners or yeah. myself, how many people are? How many as big as this whole group of people who are really into this? Is it? Is it a hundred? Is it? A, is it twenty thousand? Is it sixty thousand? Is it thirty? Oh well, I mean, if you're talking about the entire sneaker market, yeah. that's much different than the people coming to to, to campus website, sure. right? Um, what would you say yeah, that number so, is? So, all right, I it is so hard to figure out how big the, the number of people are within the sneaker market, right? Well, it's hard to define. From a seller, yeah, I mean, from, from a seller's perspective, like I said, there were 136,000 people that sold at least one pair of sneakers on eBay last year, right? Those are different eBay accounts for, you know, lack of a... Uh, yeah. So, right, and that's just the, the sell side. So, I mean, you got to figure that, I don't know, 3 million people, somewhere like that, that are, are buying it, right? If there were 750,000 pairs of, you know, the the top Jordan release sold last year, right? And there's no way that everybody buys every shoe and, and you know, people, so I don't know. I mean, my, my guess is, I don't know, maybe about 3 million people, you know, who are sneakerheads who are kind of, you know, actively part of this, you know, market and collect sneakers. It, it's a little hard to understand how someone can uh, make a living being an expert on this market. So again, without going into your personal details, which are relevant, but, but this is, are, are you making money off of this? Off a of camp list? Is this just a labor of love or is it just, um, or is it, is it profit? Is there a profit for you? It was a labor of love for a long time. Uh, I was, I started this business in early 2012 while I was working at IBM and before I, I was a strategy consultant at IBM, and before that, I'd started and run uh, a couple of startups. And so I was running campus on the side for, you know, for three plus years. And, um, and it was, it was something that was a labor of love that became a, uh, a, a, a volunteer joint labor of love as, as we ended up having a lot of people who wanted to help build this thing because they just love sneakers and love data and, and what we were doing. And so we built this into a, a larger company where the primary revenue source actually comes from selling data and selling consulting services around the secondary market where, you know, and that's all, you know, kind of the, the secondary B2B, you know, part of this business where investment firms and brands and retailers will buy data uh, related to the secondary market to help better understand the primary market. And so that was a, a revenue, you know, source for us. But, you know, the goal was always to build a, a stock market, right, or build a, a data-driven marketplace, right, because that's where the money is. If you, can be, if you can be eBay, if you can beat eBay and be a better version of that, right, that's where, you know, the, the bigger business is. And so um, I talked to just about everyone within the sneaker industry around partnering with, and there were job offers and there were acquisition offers and there were partnership offers to figure out, you know, how to take campus to the next level and how to create 
you know, a stock market and, um, and, a, and a, a different marketplace. And I talked to sneaker blogs and brands and retailers and resellers. And, and like I said, almost everyone within the, the sneaker industry. And there just wasn't a, the right fit, you know, for me to partner with and go and do this. And then one day I get a call from someone who has no current ties to the sneaker industry. And the very long, you know, story short is that I actually have sold Campless to Dan Gilbert, who's the owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers and Quicken Loans and about 100 other companies. And I'm now partnered with him in the new version of this, StockX, where uh, and I've moved to Detroit to work with Dan and build a team. And um, and so now we're, you know, running this. It's uh, it's kind of like a startup. It's kind of not. Um, and, uh, and we get to build it out and prove that a stock market can work as a construct for buying and selling physical goods and prove that within sneakers and then ultimately expand that beyond sneakers to, to other goods as well. And I happen to have a, you know, one of the most successful business people in the world as my partner to go and do this. And, and so that's what the, uh, the company and, and my job is right now. It's an incredible story. Um, I want to talk more about StockX, but just one last question about s sneakers per se. Uh, in this odyssey of the last three or four years uh, where you're, you know, doing this creative thing, pulling in data from eBay, publishing this website, writing a blog, did Nike ever contact you uh, and say, hey, this is really interesting? Or did they, did you ever contact them? Have you had relation, conversation with them at all? Yeah, uh, I have. Uh, and uh, like I said, I've talked to just about, you know, everyone within the sneaker industry uh, at some point, you know, including including Nike. And um, I've had various conversations with different people there at, at, at sort of different levels. Um, so, so yeah. Did they ever see you as a, a threat? Did they ever say anything or, or was it all good? So I don't... Well, certainly all my interactions with them have been have been great. Right. And everyone I've, I've met with, interacted with has um, has certainly treated me well. And and, uh, and no one has treated me as a, uh, um, you know, as an enemy or as a threat. Um, the I, I, Nike has a very interesting relationship with the secondary market. Everything that they do creates it. Right. And like I said, they're 96 percent of the secondary market. However, publicly, they don't acknowledge that. They have this kind of willful blindness policy towards the secondary market where, yeah, it exists. Obviously, everything they do around, you know, their supply and demand, um, you know, supply and demand creation, you know, policies, you know, create the secondary market. But um, they just kind of pretend like it, it doesn't exist. And I, I think if I worked at Nike and I kind of set those type of corporate policies, I would do that as well. I think it's just easier to kind of say, hey, you know, that's not us. You know, you guys do whatever you want, but, you know, we're not involved in that. Um, and uh, and so for that reason, um, I, it's been, you know, uh, look, we're a huge giant billboard for the secondary market. Um, and so I would never expect um, Nike to publicly support us um, and uh, or publicly come out against us. Right. I mean, it's just, you know, they would they would never sort of publicly acknowledge that because we're just not. Uh, we're just, you know, we're part of the secondary market and, and they're not, right? So that's that's their business. Sure. Uh, let's talk about StockX and just the whole idea of what a stock market for stuff would look like. You know, one of the advantages that the stock market has, the real stock market or stock markets, plural, have, is that, you know, that a share of stock is a share of stock. There's no uh, variation in it. It's a commodity. And, of course, there are commodity-like aspects to what you're you're talking about. I'm thinking about, for example, a different kind of collectible, which is books. So if you go into Amazon or Half.com, you can find almost, you know, an enormous number of books in different qualities. You can find hardcover, paperback. But even within those, there's, you know, brand new, there's like new, there's good, there's acceptable. And usually they tell you what's, you know, not quite right about these things. You know, if it's got marks in the margin and some people don't care and some people do. But – how are you going to deal with that um, if you want to expand beyond sneakers, if you want to just – if you want to create a stock market in, in collectibles, how, how are you going to solve that, um, that quality issue? Well, you know, the, at, the, at the start, right, StockX is only for dead stock shoes. Right? 
you can't create a, a, a market pricing around something that has too much variability in the, the, um, yep. uh, the value based on the condition because then you'd have to have pictures, you'd have to have a standard grading system, and, and that becomes pretty hard. Um, you know, there became a standard grading system for baseball cards and for coins, you know, and certain things that right. have, you know, standard shapes and, yep. and had an official grading, you know, system. And so you could easily, you know, integrate a standard grading system for any um, industry that has that. But to start, you just stay at the at the dead stock new level for whatever product that is. And so for some of those things, maybe it becomes a lot harder, right? Watches might be a lot harder to do than people might assume because a watch is inherently always used, right? The second a watch is made and given to a consumer, you don't know if that person is banged against a wall or, sure. you know, just because... Um, but you know, but something like, um, um, you know, something like, uh, handbags, you know, women's handbags, you know, could, you know, unused. Right. Um, and you know, and certain other pure collectibles, but you know, the concept of a, a stock market for a, um, for any consumer good is really just a, a different way of matching a buyer and seller. Right. Yep. Um, and, and that it's using that contract. Now, eventually we will actually put a securitization layer on top of sneakers and, and whatever other verticals we're working with. And, and then you can actually, you know, use this as an alternative investment vehicle. Um, but, you know, on day one, it's just about instead of getting a share of stock, right, a buyer and seller meet over price and you get a share of stock, you get a, a physical good. And every vertical that we add will have to deal with that issue around, you know, condition and how people value, you know, that particular item. Um, a, uh, a very obvious next vertical for us to add is streetwear, uh, and in particular, the brand Supreme, which is probably the most uh, resold um, you know, version of streetwear. Well, an unworn shirt or an unworn you know, jacket uh, is, a, is a defined thing, right? I mean, if it's new in the, in the plastic, or if it's never been taken out of the original wrapping, then you know that's new. And so we can create a market around that. And there is a big market for those particular clothes, which is as crazy and as secretive, right, or unknown to the, the average person as sneakers are. And so it's about finding those other verticals that have you know, similar demographics and similar type of uh, market dynamics that sneakers do. So there's two psychological aspects of this I want to talk about. Um, the first is why do people collect things? I And I'm not a collector. Um, I have, I think I have about 40 or 50, so P.G. Woodhouse books, I think he wrote 92. I don't know how many are in print. I have a lot, and it's plenty. I, I've got all the good ones that I think I have, and I've never had an urge to finish my set. Uh, so I'm not that kind of person. Could you speculate for a little bit about the psychology of that? Why? I mean, obviously, there are people who want to have every Air Jordan release in every color, um, and they never wear them. So all the utility in the economics term or all the satisfaction or value comes from knowing that you have something that's complete or do you have a lot of it. What do you think's working there? What, what's the human's urge to collect? Well, yeah, I mean, you tapped into the, the human urge to collect, or which is absolutely a, a big part of sneakers. Um, but it's not the only part, right? It It's the only part of other you know, things that people collect, right? There are certain things that people collect that have, you know, maybe they have no real uh, intrinsic value or maybe they have no function, um, you know, or they have no, you know, but sneakers are so many different things. And this is one of the reasons why when people ask, you know, is the sneaker market going to collapse? Is there going to be a, you know, a, we're not going to have a, a crash the, the way that you would think of a market crash because <clears throat> there's so many different reasons of why people buy sneakers. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I use the word, you know, say buy instead of collect because collecting is just one of the reasons. There are some people that are collectors, right? And they want to own it and they want to have it. And, and whether it's complete a, you know, some part of a collection, every model of Air Jordan or whatever it is, that's part of it. But some people buy sneakers solely to make money. They're here just as a reseller. They're just trying to make money. Some people resell, right? Not to make money as much as it just to buy more sneakers. It's a way to fund the rest of their collection, right? There's some people that just want to own the sneakers for the prestige and cachet around owning a certain rare or exclusive pair of sneakers, 
right? And that's, you know, that's kind of exponential when you take into consideration the fact that, you know, you can pay $200 and then have something that's worth $1,000. And so now you're wearing a $1,000 pair of sneakers instead of a, a $200 pair of sneakers, right? And so then you get into the concepts of, of you know, fashion and, and all the things that go around with, you know, how people dress and how people, you know, want to show off that, right? And then there's the, the kind of just pers- pure sneakerhead who just wants to, to wear the sneakers, right? He doesn't necessarily care about collecting them for, you know, its own value, uh, whether it's going to go up or whether it's going to go down. But he just wants to own them and wear them because they're sneakers. And at the end of the day, you know, you wear sneakers. And then you get into even more functional, you know, people that wear them for particular sports and performance and all that. So there's just so many different reasons, right? And, and the athlete and people who like the particular athlete or the team or whatever it is. So it, there, it's just, there's so many different parts of it, right? But the collector mentality and that, um, that person who, you know, and and the word investor, right? Obviously we're talking about stock markets and, and how it relates to what we're talking about. There's an investor aspect where the person is is collecting today and buying and holding today. They don't necessarily know why. Maybe it's because it's going to be worth more later and they're going to sell it and they want to make money. Maybe it's because it's going to be worth more later or hard to get later. So they're just buying it now. So they have it later, right? So that, that sneaker investor, right, has a lot of different motivations for basically buying now and holding, right, which is somewhat like a collector, right, but it's also based on value. So there's just so many sort of, you know, interrelated parts and the collector mentality that actually, you know, obviously applies across, you know, many other things that people collect uh, is, I think, for a lot of people, particularly kind of my demographic of sneakerheads, where, you know, the kind of uh, older demographic here, I collected baseball cards, right? I collected baseball cards. I used to collect, you know, hats. I mean, we we have a lot of the same stories, you know, kind of my demographic where we used to collect cards and that, and now we collect sneakers. I wonder what's next. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows, right? But there's a really big difference between baseball cards and sneakers, right? Yeah. Which is that baseball cards were essentially an investment, right? And once they started to become not worth the money and, and once people started to realize there were a lot more supply out there than there was, than they thought, right? There was kind of a run on baseball cards and everyone tried to sell and then, you know, they became worthless and then people didn't want to collect them anymore. I just ran through, I don't know, 10, 12 different reasons why someone will keep their sneaker, even if it isn't necessarily worth anything, right? So there is a big difference between the two. Um, but, you know, at the core around that collector mentality, that's the same. Yeah, for sure. Um, you must spend a lot of time looking down at the ground when you go out. <laughs> Absolutely. I think we all do. Uh, I think all, all sneakerheads in, inherently uh, look at people's shoes first. Um, one, because you never know what you're going to see. Uh, but also, it's a it's kind of a way to identify other sneakerheads. I mean, if you see someone wearing a particular pair of sneakers, you know they collect sneakers because there just isn't any other way to get that particular pair. Um, but it's also, you know, you never know what you're going to see. So, yeah, absolutely. Do you talk to strangers? Uh, I don't, um, I, you know, I don't like to bother, you know, people, um, more of an introvert in, anyway, but I've definitely had people come up to me and comment on my sneakers and, and, uh, and I certainly will, uh, we'll talk to them about it. Uh, how many pairs do you think you could recognize by sight? If you were say at the mall or at the game or somewhere out in a, where there's a crowd and I said, what are those? Uh, how, what do you think your, your, your rate, your success rate would well, be? Well, well, there's, I mean, so there's there's three thousand pairs or so on campus. So certainly every one of those, uh, and then you got at least I don't know at least four or five times that. So I don't know fifteen thousand maybe. Wow, <laughs> I mean a lot, right? But, but there's also a lot that are just I know there's one shoe that's been produced in fifty different colors, right? Right. So you know, but but yeah, I mean I certainly you know I, I definitely know. And, and that's another area where. Um, you know, we talked about, I have 300 pairs of sneakers, but you know, there's people that have many more. There's a lot of people that are much more, uh, have a lot more knowledge about sneakers than I do in terms of just the history of every shoe and, you know, who've been working in sneakers, you know, all their life. Um, I've just been a, you know, a consumer and, uh, you know, a passionate, you know, fan of sneakers, but I've only been working in sneakers for a couple of years. On your on your uh, website, you ask whether sneakers are more like stocks or drugs. What do, what do you mean by that question? Yeah, I mean, 
the the sneaker market has as unbelievable similarities to the illegal drug trade um, in every way, except for you know it not being illegal or um, you know or a substance that will you know that will uh, hurt your body. Um, the you have a a central uh, distribution you know supplier right Nike, which you know operates and this is not a a negative you know shot at them right but they operate like a, a drug cartel. Um, they, they're the basically the only supplier, you know, they can, can, they decide who gets what, when, um, and you know, if you don't like it, you know, too bad. Right. I mean, there's, there's not much that you can do about that. Um, and, uh, and they have kind of complete control over it. And then the way that sneakers get distributed down is not kind of unlike the drug hierarchy where, you know, a store gets, you know, some allocation, right? And then they sell it and then those resellers will get some amount of, of supply from them and they will sell it out and, and people will try to resell it, you know, to, to make some money to pay for their habit. I mean, you know, people, sneakerheads even use the word cop, C-O-P, to refer to buying a sneaker. They're like, oh, you know, yeah, you're going to cop, you know, which is a, a drug, you know, term. Um, so it, it looks, you know, very much, you know, like that. The data, however, looks exactly like a stock market, right? We have we have stocks, we have shoes that you know have a price and increase in value, and people are buying and selling them and, and create a, a market price you know around them that changes for every sneaker has a different market price and a different you know supply um, uh, you know supply um, profile, right? As opposed to you know uh, drugs, which would be you know you you kind of have a, a single product you know with with a, a certain so. Um, there's a, it, it kind of, it looks like both of them and, uh, and people use those terms. Uh, people use stock terms all the time around, you know, investing and, and, um, and profit on it as opposed to people also use drug terms and terminology around it. So it's a really interesting thing. And, uh, and I use the term, you know, drug cartel in the most positive <laughs> sense. It, you know, it's just, it just, there just isn't a better example, right. Except the fact that they're not selling, you know, an illegal product or, or, you know, killing people for it. So my guest today has been Josh Luber. Josh, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks for having me. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.